Good morning, thank you for joining us today. It's Webinar Wednesday, it's May, and today we are going to be looking at um, what is a cavity for? So, my name is Katie, I'm Digital Services Specialist here at CABE, and I'll be um, here just to assist as we go through this morning's presentation. You can get involved during this uh, during the session, and on your screen, depending on whether you're on a, a desktop computer, a laptop, or a, an iPad device, I think, but you will have the option, there'll be an admin panel on your screen, either to the right or perhaps to the top. And within there, you can actually go in and type those questions, which is what we like. We like to have a nice interactive session. So as we go along, send us some questions in, they'll pop up on our screen, and what we'll do is answer the questions either as we go along, so if, if it's on something that we're actually addressing at that moment, we'll, we'll pick up on the questions, or potentially we can leave the questions and um, pick them up towards the end. If you're on Twitter, you can catch us at hashtag CABECPD. Now, we also record our webinars, and they're available on our YouTube channel, so we're aware that some of you may be watching these in effect on catch-up, so we're not actually there to answer your questions, but we do have an email address, which is technical at cbuild.com. So if you are watching via another means, then by all means, again, send us any questions through, and we will answer them for you. So, speaking today and, help, and uh, talking you through the presentation is Kevin, our Technical Director. Now, Kevin at the moment is currently in Scotland. He's in Glasgow having uh, represented us yesterday at our Build Edge Scotland event. So, he is at a different location, so technology is slightly different to what we're used to compared to when he's in the office. So, all being well, we should be absolutely fine, but we may have a few things where we need to just step in and change a few things along the way. But, again, as I say, all being well, we should be... Uh, Absolutely fine. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kevin, and he will take you through the presentation. Good morning, and thank you, Katie, for sort of explaining that we are a little bit remote and using different technology. We have got backup facilities in place. Um, hopefully, you can all hear me fairly clearly. Today, um, as build, we're going to talk about um, wall construction and particularly the cavity. And this is driven really by an increasing level of concern within the industry um, that we provide a cavity for a purpose and increasingly we're now using it for other things such as providing insulation standards and there's a, an element of um, works being carried out and problems being caused by where we're actually trying to get to. So I think it's worth just considering really initially what the main purpose of cavity walls were and why we got to where we are and it's because obviously for uh, decades centuries we constructed solid wall construction either out of masonry or out of stone and provided it was thick enough uh, the elements being as they are the outer surfaces would get wet that would penetrate into the structure but normally with climatic change we'd get wind dry, um, wind drying the wall and drawing the moisture back out again before it permeated all the way through the construction. But in those older properties there was always the potential for moisture to percolate over a period of time through the walls. So starting first of all in exposed locations, particularly coastal areas with a lot of wind driven um, moisture, where it was getting constant wetting and not necessarily so much of the drying effect, um, cavity started to be introduced so that when the moisture hit the inside of the cavity it then all had an opportunity to dry out within that void and didn't transmit through onto the internal surface and that inter that airspace originally would have been ventilated with air bricks to aid in that drying process even though it was ventilated it did as a consequence improve the thermal performance of that wall um, and as a result, it sort of st opened the door to think about how we could improve that further. Typically, though, in terms of structural terms, as long as the external and the, the internal leaves were tied together properly, they still performed essentially as one structural unit. And then obviously as time's moved on, we've got to the situation where um, we've now got cavity construction or potentially a masonry skin and a framed construction internally, which is doing the same sort of thing. But a lot of the concerns that are happening um, at the moment are around cavity wall insulation being 
introduced into properties and causing subsequent problems. And the sort of figures that are being bandied about in the media are something like one and a half million properties that have been provided with county wall insulation when they weren't really suitable for treatment. And as a result, moisture penetration is occurring, damps occurring. Um, because it's shifted the dew point within the, the construction, we're getting um, con more condensation and mold issues. And there's a claim that an awful lot of these properties have um, been blighted and their values fallen significantly. Now, um, just to give an example of this, uh, I only a couple of weeks ago had somebody call around to my property. I live in a property that's about 15 years old, and maybe a little bit older. Um, and they were doing the normal sort of thing, you know, were you aware there's grant fund available, you can have your county walls filled to virtually nothing, and all of this sort of thing. And I said to the chap who was coming around and suggesting county wall fill, I said, yeah, I hear what you say, but I live in a property that was built with a partial fill insulation. And I know this because I core drilled through for a dishwasher outlet, and you can actually see what the construction was. Uh, and he said, well, you, you, you're being really odd and strange here. He said, everybody else on the estate has had it done. And I thought, first of all, if that's the case, why are you knocking on doors? It can't be a good return on investment. Um, but then he revealed to me the key way in which they what the construction of the existing property is, which is simply to go to the plastic meter boxes on the external wall, open them up, and look at the, the, the hole that... Um, surrounds the service entry into the property, which is usually open in part to the cavity, and they look through there as an indication of the condition of the cavity and the degree of insulation. And clearly that, as a, as a method of establishing whether the property is suitable for filling, is just not appropriate. And as a result, we're ending up with a significant number of uh, properties that are um, inappropriately filled. Um, the scale of the problem, as I said, it, it's difficult to judge. People, there's some figures say 1.5 million properties are blighted. Um, statistics actually tell us that in the last couple of decades, over 6 million properties have been retrofitted with cavity wall insulation. And in a large number of the cases, there have been some adverse effects in terms of um, the performance of the property moving forward. And unfortunately, we're in a where there's blame, there's a claim type culture now. So uh, I'm not going to name the legal practice, um, but by Googling around this sort of thing, the, the typical sort of, you know, we'll make your claim on your behalf at no fee to you, is there in the legal circles for people making claims as, pro as a result of problems caused, they claim, by cavity wall insulation. So there's an increasing industry now looking at claiming against um, companies that have provided the insulation and the surveyors who advise them um, in looking, seeking some redress where it's claimed that there's a, a problem with these issues. And one of the actual boom sectors in construction at the moment is the uh, removal of cavity wall insulation. Um, the number of removals has risen significantly in recent years, and obviously to a certain extent it depends um, what was put in in terms of insulation as to how easy that may be, because something like um, unbonded uh, polybeads or mineral fibre can be reasonably easily extracted using a vacuum process. But when something's gone in with a bonding agent to it and therefore is solid, it can be a very extensive process to remove some of these elements. So, moving on and looking at some of the other bits and pieces that we consider in terms of cavity wall, back to, if you like, the subject of what's the cavity for. Well, it's there, it does form part of our damp proofing, but it's also part of our structural envelope of the building. And to perform that structural element of the work, it is critical to get the, the, the wall ties correctly positioned and at the correct spacing so that the wall is working as a structural element. And I'm sure many of you will have seen examples uh, recently where the requirements to improve insulation standards in new build properties has led to increasingly wide cavities 
being adopted. And I, know, I was at a presentation really recently where somebody was uh, talking about a case study about a passive house type building. Um, and they were talking about a, a 300 millimeter wide cavity um, to um, achieve the insulation standard, which not only led to a great deal of query about whether structurally the leaves acted um, as one component, but also the, the practical issues about where do you site your windows and frames in that reveal um, and gain an adequate fixing. But when we're looking at the, the wall ties, they've got to be effectively um, bedded into the mortar joints, um, but they've also got to include that all important drip in an area that will encourage the moisture to drop off within the cavity rather than transmit to the inner leaf. And then clearly if we have got the sort of um, partial fill insulation, then those wall ties will also be providing the, the clip to hold the insulation in place. Okay, so our options in terms of our cavity construction, we have the um, open cavity um, with the um, vented or unventilated airspace. If we, it's not ventilated, it will improve the performance characteristics. And that's probably the construction that we were building up until probably the early 80s, potentially. And then we sort of started moving to either higher performance masonry on the internal leaf or partial fill insulation or possibly a combination of the two for some properties and at the same time using the option of the full fill um, construction. With either with this and particularly when we get to the full fill construction, the manufacturers of the, of the materials will have tested and um, declared that these materials are water resistant to a certain extent and quite often the, the fibres or that make up some of the, the wool type bats with the solvent to make them more water resistant. So the issue then becomes, um, is it an effective continuous barrier? Because if you if we end up with something that's water resistant that ends up with a slight hole within it, you can end up getting that moisture penetration. Okay, so um, I'm getting a few comments through and I'm sure Katie's picking up on some of the technical bits um, in terms of whistling on the line and, and bits and bobs and I've got to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what's going on with some of that because um, I can't, I, I, there is an occasional uh, beeping, sorry, oops, some of the screen's just changed, there is an occasional beeping and to be honest it's not a problem with the IT, I think unfortunately it's the refuse trucks reversing in the street outside me so I apologise for that. Um, I'm running through any of the other bits and pieces, but I think I'll, I'll pick up some of the other questions as we uh, carry on and, and run through. Um, yeah, and obviously thank you very much for some of the comments about the fact I'm in Scotland and, and um, subject to their hospitality this morning. Right. So, trying to get the presentation to move forward and trying to pick up some of these issues at the same time. So, when we look at the damp penetration through the cavity wall, um, as I say, there's an expectation with masonry that moisture will penetrate through the external leaf. And that will depend on the, the type of masonry that's used and has been prepared. If we look at something like a, an engineering brick, that's going to be fairly resistant to moisture coming through it. If we look at something like a handmade or a calcium silicon break, brick at the other end of the spectrum, that might be more susceptible to moisture coming through that outer leaf. Um, what will also have a fairly big impact on the moisture penetration through the structure will be something like the attention to detail, the pointing of the brickwork, how that's actually done. Now this is the sort of thing that's, that's taught at the craft level to the bricklayers in terms of what, what's appropriate and how you should finish the joints, but quite often, um, there will be issues in terms of what's needed in terms of aesthetics that may have an impact on this moisture um, as we go through. So other things that we're going to have with issues in terms of the, the wall construction, the wall ties themselves. Um, it's always difficult if you look at uh, the specification, the recommendations in terms of wall ties, it tells you that there should be a slight slope down from the inner to outer leaf in terms of the positioning of the tie. But obviously sometimes in building the brick course 
you don't have that disparity between levels between in and outer to get a, a full across. But what is absolutely critical in terms of the wall tie is the amount that's embedded in each leaf to make sure that it's doing its structural job. Um, and the position of the, the drip to encourage that moisture to fall off sitting in the clear space within the cavity. Good quality workmanship is important. If the, if the bricklayer pushes the wall tie down too far into the mortar rather than just laying it in the mortar joint, then it ends up actually tight to the masonry, um, sitting under the mortar and therefore not getting a, a good structural bond. Um, if it's too much in one leaf and not another, again, it's failing to do its job. And the issue, obviously, of debris and mortar going down the cavity and building up on the wall tie is problematic in an open cavity. But as soon as then insulation is installed into that situation, you get the additional issue that the moisture has then got nowhere to drop to or evaporate as it would in an open cavity. So wall tie spacing is important and it, it is to a certain extent specific to the particular project but generally nowadays obviously a lot of the wall tie spacing that we put into properties is actually dictated by the size of the insulation bats if they're being built in as work progress although realistically it actually works the other way around the, the specification of wall ties tends to determine the, um, the bat sizes but obviously it's important to be aware that as we start to increase the width of the cavity not only may we need to look at longer wall ties to make sure we get the embedment, but obviously the actual the, the, the gauge and the performance of those wall ties may need to be greater than we would have expected. And at some point we have to come to the conclusion that what we've actually got is a, a, a blockwork inner skin um, and a separate uh, facade cladding, which aren't necessarily acting as the one unit any further. Right, I'm just going to have a quick scroll through and see if there's any questions that aren't IT and sound related. And I do apologise for what some of the problems we seem to be experiencing this morning. And um, Katie, have you picked up on any other questions that seem to be coming in? Yes, hi Kevin. Uh, if you, um, okay. you want to go sort of towards the top of the questions that are coming in, we've got a question from George, um, who works a major warranty provider, and he's asking if we're aware of any deterioration with older capital ties. So are there any simple methods of uh, testing the ties and establishing their integrity? Yes, uh, I think the answer to that question in terms of deterioration of all ties and what may be happening, can you physically test? The only thing you can do um, is a sort of two-step test. You can obviously remove bricks or drill holes, um, use endoscopes to have a look at what's actually happening to the tie. The other thing that you can do if you physically want to, to do a, a test to see how effective it still is, is remove some of the masonry around the tie and then simply do a pull test to see how much force it takes to remove the tie. Um, one of the major issues, particularly with the, the older metal ties, even if they were galvanized when they started life, that may well have disappeared um, or, or been damaged in part. But as a metal tie corrodes, um, I think one of the things that we tend to underestimate in the industry is exactly how much that tie will expand um, and the fact that corroded steel and iron takes up a lot more space than um, uncorroded steel. And again, there's this sort of perception that, that rust, if you like, is the weak material. And I think that's because at some stage we've all gone along, felt under the wheel arch of the car and bits of rust fall off on our hand and, and it doesn't seem particularly strong. But in that confined situation within the mortar joint, um, you can see significant movement. And if every time in the, in the height of a two-story property is suffering corrosion in the outer leaf compared to the inner leaf, what you get is you get expansion of all of those joints where the ties are to the extent that the wall has bulged significantly over the whole height of the wall because it's now longer on the outer leaf than it is on the inner leaf. Um, so yes, it's something that needs to be considered, particularly in older properties. You can quite often see it on the joints as they start to expand and you may even see pockets of rust start to show. Physically, as I say, you can do a sort of a pull test if you expose the ties, 
Otherwise, it's a question of inserting an endoscope or a camera into the cavity to see what's there. But again, that's only possible where it's a clear cavity. If you then to uh, fulfilled, you can't do that sort of exploratory view without removing panels of brickwork. And popping up to the top of the, um, the questions, there was a question from Harry. Um, what do we think about the report, the coal report on the collapsing outer leaves in Edinburgh schools? in terms of the, um, the future use of cavity construction. Um, obviously, within the coal report, there are a number of issues that led to those collapses. Um, and I think, as a result, you know, there will be a number of options looked at. Whether it is a case of we, we move away from cavity construction, we go back to solid with a, a decent render on the outside or a cladding system on the outside, or we just focus on a better standard of um, workmanship and construction of what we are actually doing. I think what it done is focus the mind on the correct specification and then the correct actual construction and workmanship to make sure that these things actually are effective in real use. In reality, constructed properly with the right ties, the right cavity in the right location and not um, and looking at exposure, particularly when we're looking at whether or not there's a suitable insulation system to provide. If it's all done properly, then it should perform perfectly well. It's only if you like the potential for things to go wrong. And I think back to where we started with this presentation, like one of the issues is the reason we're seeing problems with um, retrofit insulation is obviously we are applying something now to something that wasn't originally designed to have that um, element installed in it. Right, I'm going to pick up on a couple of the other comments as we continue, but back to the, the presentation. Um, and looking at the, the, the general weather resistance issues, uh, we do have to take in consideration that not every cavity is suitable um, for insulation because of some of the weather resistance we have. If we have a particularly porous outer skin, if we have prolonged um, exposure conditions, it may be that we don't want to do that. And in addition, we do have to be careful, particularly retrofit, about where we insulate. And obviously, you will get this balance between internal lining, um, external lining, which is being done a lot on solid wall properties at the moment, and cavity fill. Because as we change the thermal characteristics of that wall, we will be changing where the natural dew point occurs. And there's the potential on some occasions that what used to um, manifest itself as a surface condensation may actually move and become um, a condensation within the structure, which is potentially more damaging in the long term because we're not aware of the effects until such time as um, the, the, the material fails and we, we see something significant happening rather than the initial effect of, of maybe spotting a bit of condensation on the internal leaf. So there's a lot of attention got to be paid to the detail. And there is an education exercise here as well. Um, most property owners, particularly householders, tend to think that the external envelope, the, the brick walls, the, the slate or, or the concrete tiled roof, will last forever and carry out minimal maintenance. And then, to be honest, when they start to think that maintenance needs to be done, they're tempted to go along to the, the DIY store and buy the cans that say exactly what they do on the tin and just apply a clear coat to the external wall and hope that's going to cure the problem. And actually looking at the, the pointing of the brickwork, making sure that there's no spalling on the faces of the brickwork, and doing that on a fairly regular basis is fairly critical. Um, one of the other elements to think about when we're expo um, considering what we're doing with the wall is the exposure. It was a, obviously in the first place it's exposure that led us to introduce cavity walls and determine where or not we should um, fill. What we tend to do when we're looking at exposure now is we consult um, national standards and some data maps to get a view of what sort of exposure we are. Now, don't be fooled by this slide. The picture of the UK and, and bits of Europe is not one of the exposure maps and the colours don't represent the exposure. It's purely a graphical image of what the UK looks like, um, just in case you'd forgotten. But in reality, um, you can go and look up exposure maps and you will get an exposure for a geographical area um, and then you will make some sort of localised adjustments to that. So you'll adjust 
um, to allow for local conditions. So if you're particularly um, exposed on a hill site with a prevailing wind condition, then you'll adjust the national exposure for that. Um, you'll also potentially adjust the exposure if you can't be quite sure what quality of, of build you're going to get. And then once you come to the, the final conclusion of what your resultant exposure factor might be, that will then um, help you select the correct type of insulation material um, to match that and the correct construction. And that's obviously something that designers and specifiers need to do as part of the process when they're specifying what we're going to see. So what are the problems we're likely to get? Uh, well, in our cavity wall, if we build in insulation as we go, particularly if we build it in as partial fill, the typical problems that we see retrospectively are that um, the uh, uh, insulation um, might not necessarily be treated to prevent moisture. Um, if it's gone in um, in slightly the wrong places, if it overlaps too far in relation to the damp proof course and the like, then we may get moisture penetration into it. And with most insulation materials, they rely on a, a high degree of, of air content to provide that insulation standard. And once that air is filled up with moisture, then um, it's lost that standard. Uh, and sort of as, as an aside, to be perfectly honest, one of the other big queries about insulation at the moment is that the one in six properties in the UK that are um, susceptible to flood. Uh, if we have a, an, an insulation material that's within the cavity that was going to absorb that moisture in a flood situation, then there's an awful lot of retrospective work to be done um, to remove and replace that post incident. The other problems we get with, with built-in insulation is that the mortar droppings and the mortar snots that get in between the insulation bats um, and cause a pathway for moisture to get in. And again, even if there's just a gap between the bats, that gap will run across the top of the resistant insulation and show itself on the internal leaf. And I, um, I once dealt with a, a brand new housing estate and numerous properties at the end of it, I ended up with little circles of damp at a regular pattern. And they were just coming through the tops of the insulation bats as a fairly regular um, occurrence. And then we get to the issue where we've got the wrong wall ties, they haven't got the right clips, the drip ends up within the insulation rather within the cavity, or the badly secured bat um, falls across the cavity later on. And that quite often occurs where you've got an odd, odd sized bat as part of the process where it doesn't, the whole wall isn't built to the modular size of the insulation. So numerous problems there that can occur within built-in insulation. Within the, the retrofit side, um, we get a lot of the, the similar sort of problems, but a lot of it on the retrofit side comes down to how well the installation was done. And any gaps, whether they're just generally within the construction, whether they're around what was maybe an, an original moisture penetration across the wall, something like a, a mortar snot that has been drying out in an open cavity, but as soon as it's enclosed with insulation, can't dry out as well, um, will lead to a potential path for moisture to track across the bottom of that gap. Um, also, retrofitting can have an adverse effect on any moisture that is tracking across cavity wall ties because the, the wall tie is designed to induce that water to drip off at midpoint. If it's surrounded in insulation, that water may track all the way across. Um, and I think you know we're, we're all aware that if they don't do the insulation properly, particularly around reveals and around openings, you end up with getting gaps. Now this is fairly easy to see after or post installation um, because this is the sort of situation where a thermal imaging uh, camera will identify where those cold spots are within the construction. Um, not necessarily as easy then to go in and sort out, but at least it's it's a little bit easier to understand what's actually happening and going on within the wall. Um, so the question then, you know, well, I've got all these problems with, with cavity walls. Um, why don't we go back to solid wall construction? And I suppose that the, the big problem is that, yes, a cavity may transmit moisture across if something's gone wrong in the construction. But in the solid wall construction, our, our moisture resistance is really going to rely 
on the external face of the masonry in any um, uh, render or cladding that's applied to it. Um, ex a brickwork uh, wall with no external rendering is a path to moisture and it will depend on the, the prevailing weather conditions as to whether that becomes a problem or not. In addition, it's much more difficult to get a solid wall construction to meet the sort of high standards of insulation that we're looking at within building regulations and building standards uh, today, and it's difficult to get that. And obviously, the existing solid wall properties in the retrofit insulation market are those that are labelled as you know, difficult to treat because you end up having to apply either an internal or an external um, cladding system to provide the insulation, and that makes life even more problematic in terms of viewpoints and condensation may occur within the structure. And then I suppose I have to try and relate this back to, to building regulations, and I've quoted here some some. England and Wales regulations, but the same provisions are within parts of the, the technical standards um, within Scotland. Um, so what is suggested in terms of complying with part A, C and L uh, in England and Wales, a solid wall um, can meet the requirements in terms of moisture penetration if it's at least 250 millimetres thick, so it can pass um, part C if you like, um, whereas the cavity wall, um, two leaves of masonry in a 50 mil cavity is considered to do the same thing. When it comes to the materials that we're using for the insulation, um, then our regulations and standards tell us that they should be subject to certification from an appropriate uh, body, um, currently a European technical approval. Obviously that may change as we go forward in terms of Brexit, um, but I think we're all fairly used to seeing the, the, the UK equivalent of that, the, the sort of Agramont board type arrangement in terms of testing the material and predicting how it's going to perform within the long term. So that's been a, a fairly quick sort of overview of, of where we are with cavities at the moment. If I was a, a, a private investor looking for someone to invest at the moment, I probably would be investing in the um, cavity wall insulation removal market because it does seem to be a bit of a boom at the moment. Um, but I think what we need is a degree of care. We need to make sure that we are um, specifying the right material for the right location. Uh, we are carefully considering the walls that we actually apply retrofit to. And I think, to be honest, the next big thing will also be to carefully consider if there's a real need to remove, because there is a sort of a knee-jerk reaction at the moment to removing cavity wall insulation, and some of it, again, may not be as necessary as people particularly think. Right, and um, oh, sides have flipped forward a little bit too far. Right, I'm going to try and pick up some of the, the questions that have come in. If there are any more, obviously please type away quickly and I'll try and cover them all off. Um, so let's just see. Do, do, do. Don't worry. Right, where cavities are 100 mil wide or more, I was under the impression that ties required to be spaced horizontally at 750 centimeters, not heavier gauges set as um, stated. Um, yes, it's true. Um, as you get to wider cavities, you need to look at um, the, the spacing of the ties. Typically, they will end up being a heavier gauge as well because they are before, there's more of a, a tension role in terms of roll, uh, tying the two leads forward. The more that and the, the bigger that element becomes, the more it needs to increase in gauge as well. But, but so it tends to be both. It tends to be actually increasing the centers and increasing the gauge. You're absolutely right. Um, where a rendered system is used, used externally on a cavity wall, do you still need to provide weep holes at cavity tray positions? Um, yes, I mean, obviously, the, the, the the concept of the weep hole at the cavity tray is that the moisture that gets through the external leaf um, that then runs potentially down the cavity side of the, the external leaf gets to an opening and gets to a cavity tray at that point and needs to flow back out. Um, the question, do I need weep holes? I mean, the, the external render will prevent the moisture getting in in the first place, but it would still be good practice to provide the weep holes just in case anything's got in through the structure it can then effectively get back out. Because the, the problem is, although it shouldn't get in in the first place, if you have a fully rendered surface with no weep holes, it may well end up trapped within the construction. And if that moisture gets 
um, starts to put clay back out and ends up sat behind the the rendering there is a danger that over a period of time particularly in extreme cold conditions where that water will expand you'll get a deep bond of the, the rendering and it may well um, fall off uh, where are we now um, um, waterproofing agent on a cavity brick wall with cavity wall insulation that's down what does can right okay that's fine kind of, I think we should um, Eco houses built with straw and clay blocks and, and other forms of construction. We do see a lot of this. We see straw bale properties. We talk about clay blocks. Um, people talk about going back to, um, you know, basically cob type construction, that sort of thing. All of these things have a place in terms of sustainability and in terms of maybe some of the energy performance things. And it is going back to tried and tested construction from um, decades if not centuries ago but they will all rely on how you externally finish these or how thick the construction is to allow for that drying out without the damp getting to the inside and I think the issue is here as well it's about a customer expectation um, people 50 60 years ago if the, if the house was a little bit damp um, it was sort of expected if it was a solid wall and what people tended to do was they tended to you know, chuck a bit more coal on the fire, open a window and just try and get any damp out that way. And I think there's an element that, you know, the, the end user isn't as tolerant of buildings not performing as they thought they were, as perhaps they used to be. And also, we have this, this other um, major industry issue under consideration, though, that as we get um, properties more and more airtight, we end up with more issues in terms of moisture and condensation and that is becoming a focus. So whereas something might have dried out in the past, it's not necessarily um, getting the opportunity to now. Uh, right, where are we? Uh, there's a trend of overcladding existing buildings um, and increasing the wall thickness, uh, but then you do get issues with uh, Bills and where you install it and, and doorways and the practical thing in terms of internally about how far it is in, to reach into the reveal to open the window with, with the window handle and yeah there are issues in terms of how that's happening with the thicker constructions and again um, in uh, England and Wales I'm uh, oh, sorry in England under the, the newer part M the consideration of how far you reach into the window um, is considered and there, there is consideration within the regulations about how far that window is set or, or the, particularly the door is set into the reveal um, to make the window the, the door handle still accessible to somebody um, so that is in there in parts of part M for, particularly for doors in England at the moment as well All right okay what have I got now? Okay, um, some of the things I haven't covered off in this, and I'll look at as to whether we can look at it as a, as a sort of a construction detailing webinar maybe sometime in the future, is things like how we, we deal with the junction of the insulation, the floor slab, and maintaining a clear cavity um, below damp course so that we can get moisture penetration in there. So it's not something I've built into this presentation. But I will look at whether we should we'll do a future webinar just on some of the key detailing issues that perhaps need to, to sit in there in terms of how we put these things together. Um, because obviously, yes, there, there is an issue that if the if the moisture doesn't penetrate the insulation, what happens to it when it gets down to damp proof course level? And it is a, a real requirement for a focus there from the designers to make sure that detailing is correct to maintain the insulation so that we don't get a cold bridge. But just as important, you know, make sure that the damp proofing actually works as well. Right. Uh, in terms of dampness, we need to be carefully consider the ventilation process, um, particularly where people are using mechanical ventilation, heat recovery systems. Yeah, I think as I've said, the, the more we, we make things airtight and relies on a system and, and something's actually then requiring a, a conscious decision by the householder or maybe humidistats or, or what have you, um, 
we're almost creating a problem and then solving it with another solution that creates the then ongoing maintenance problem. With all of these things in terms of the ventilation system and how the property works, there is a key need to educate the end user and explain to them what's happening with their building and how they deal with it and how they can address some of the issues and what they need to do to keep the building functioning properly because again, um, a lot of householders don't necessarily take that level of responsibility, they just expect to get in and it works and it, it is very strange. You know, so if you buy a brand new car, car, you expect to regularly check the oil and the water and, and everything else, although the technology might tell you to do it now. But people just expect the building to carry on working with very little um, additional maintenance. Um, there's some comments here about some of the cavity wall insulation that's that's certified because it resists water penetration. Um, and again, it's very much as I was trying to explain in the slide. If it's installed correctly, it's fine. If it's not installed correctly, that waterproofing quality that it has may actually in itself form a moisture path for for something to get through to the internal leaf. And therefore, um, it's, it's not ideal. Now, somebody's picked up on the example I was giving in my property right at the beginning, where they're saying, um, in retrofit terms, um, is it possible to retrofit a partially filled cavity? Well, there are some manufacturers of um, retrofit cavity wall insulation that will say that they can install their um, injected or blown in product alongside an existing cavity wall bat. Um, the difficulty comes that sometimes you get a chemical reaction at that point. Um, sometimes you can get a, a, a moisture path at that point. Um, but I think what's critical in looking at whether that's suitable or not is not only looking at what the, the testing is for the manufacturer's retrofit insulation, but also looking re in reality at the um, why or, or how the existing partial fill will interact because the, the, any any certification and testing of the existing probably won't have considered an additional layer being added and fundamentally we have to remember that the reason that we put in um, partial fill was to gain the benefit of both it was to get insulation but to keep ourselves a clear residual cavity um, and to be perfectly honest with you most partial fills that were done um, in the sort of 80s, 90s, the residual cavity was down to the, the minimum 25 millimetres. And if you look at it on a cost-benefit analysis, the additional benefit, if you've, got, if you've already got a lightweight insulating block, 25 mil cavity wall bat or 50 mil cavity wall bat, 25 mil residual cavity, um, the additional benefit in terms of insulation and any savings on energy bills compared to the actual cost of insulation is going to be negligible. Um, the overall change is not going to be significant. As you do an old-fashioned heat loss calculation through the structure, you will take into account each um, element. But when you get to that cavity, you take into account the resistance of the actual exposed surfaces. So once you fill that space, you do gain resistance from the additional insulation, but you lose those surfaces. Um, and so on paper, to be honest, I'd be very surprised if it stacks up with a decent payback period to fill in the residual part of the cavity if you had a partial fill in the first place. Okay, um, and I think there's a sort of a, a, a more of a, a comment than a, a question popped in at the end from Harry on the bottom of my list anyway that says a good clerk of works would resolve many of the problems, particularly those in the, the Edinburgh schools. And I think we, we totally agree that, uh, you know, in essence, one of the problems with the, the, the way the industry is developed now is that all of us with a role to, 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 to carry out, whether it's design, whether it's building control, building verification, um, whether it's um, constructing, to be honest, there's very little time in the process for people to pay attention and super, the degree of supervision design works that we would expect or would have had in days gone by when the client was prepared to fund a clerk of works to be there looking at the job on a regular basis. Okay, um, Katie, have you picked up any other questions that I've missed? Um, no, I think, to be fair, you, you pretty much covered everything off, but there's one there that perhaps is quite a good closing question, and it's kind of a bit over to you, Kevin, but it is. In your opinion, what is the future 
the cavity wall insulation? Where's it going to go? Right. I mean, I think despite the, the number of properties that we're seeing um, having issues, we will definitely see cavity wall insulation um, continue, uh, particularly in the new build sector, um, because ultimately, you know, although there are a lot of properties where there are issues, the um, uh, a larger number of properties where it's perfectly effective, which goes to show that if the specification is right and the installation is right, then it will work effectively. I think the big challenge for us is that um, within the UK, if we are going to hit our sort of targets in terms of reduction of CO2 and greenhouse gases, um, the big elephant in the room that's been ignored over the last 10, 15 years in changes in legislation is the fact that um, you know, 50, no, probably 75% of the properties that will be in use in 30 years' time when we're supposed to have reduced our CO2 emissions by 85% in the UK, they're already built, they're already standing, they were built to previous standards. Um, and to achieve those aspirations in terms of CO2, either you've got to say, right, we're going to knock all those properties down and rebuild new ones, which just isn't going to happen um, and couldn't physically be done anyway, or we've got to come up with a strategy of how we are going to perform, improve the performance of those properties. And ultimately, cavity wall insulation is the only way to do it. What I think will happen over the next few years is that the regime of ensuring that the correct level of inspection uh, is carried out before an installation goes ahead will be tightened up. Um, to make sure that we are only installing the insulation in the properties where they're actually suitable for it to go into. But that's just my personal opinion. Okay, um, in which case I think that's covered off most of the questions. As Katie said, if you're watching this afterwards or if you've watched it live and you have any subsequent thoughts or issues, please just drop us an email and we'll pick up those up as we go. Um, otherwise, I'm going to hand back to you now and Katie to wrap up. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time this morning, Kevin, and uh, thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's joined us. Um, again, huge apologies for those sound issues that we had about 10 minutes in, but I think from what Kevin was saying, it was actually the bin lorry reversing um, behind the hotel room that he's in in Scotland, because I know that these the issues did then disappear and we've obviously carried on absolutely fine. So just want to bring your attention to the next webinars that we've got scheduled. So the next webinar Wednesday is the 14th of June, where we're looking at safety at outdoor events. And then on the 12th of July, we're looking into designing to minimise the risk and impact of arson. So if there's um, anything there that interests you, then please do sign up. Go to our website, cbld.com slash webinars, and uh, all the details are there. And also you'll get the details in the link that... Um, from the email that comes out just after this event. Um, so that's an hour of CPD for this morning. So again, thank you very much. As Kevin says, if you've got any further questions, pop them over to us. But we, uh, we do hope to see you online soon. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>